Now, I have a lengthy introduction, but I promise you it's going somewhere. Um, I think it goes without saying... Why'd you laugh? I think it goes without saying that everybody has worries in life. It's commonly said that worrying is the opposite of faith. And if that's the case, well, you can call me the biggest sinner in this room because I worry all the time. I have many worries. I worry about my family. I worry about the church. I worry about my health. I worry about my friends. I worry about making money. I worry about making mistakes. I worry about getting old. I worry about getting hurt. I worry about getting sick, and the list just goes on and on and on and on. And you might say, well, preacher, aren't you supposed to be more spiritual than that? And I go, yeah, amen. You're right. I am. I shouldn't worry so much when I have the Lord to help me through all these problems. But I still do worry, and that worries me too. And can I tell you something? The same applies to you. Some of you are worried about finances, being able to make rent, being able to feed a family, uh, not having to live paycheck to paycheck. I see some of you laughing. I mean, this is probably true, huh? So I, some of you are worrying about finding the right kind of spouse. Uh, will he love me? Can she cook? Can he support me? Some of you are worried about those kinds of things. Some of you are worried about making it just till tomorrow and not getting sick or falling or getting into an accident. I mean, some of you guys are just so accident prone. I've heard about three different occasions today about people getting into accidents. And I, I worry for you sometimes about that. <laughs> some of you just, you know, I got to pray for you extra. Whatever the case is, worry is more common in the Christian's life than any of us would care to admit. Can we at least agree to that? Now, I have a question for you. If scientists somehow made up, came up with a magic medicine that could alter the way that your brain handles cortisol so that you no, you no longer ever have to feel worry or anxiety, how many people do you think would take it? Well, I th preacher, I thought they already made that. I thought those were antidepressants. I thought those were anti-anxiety pills. Well, obviously, it's not working. Based on the amount of fear and stress and anxiety and worry and concern going on in our country and in our churches, it's plain to see that we haven't found the cure for concern. And I think the problem stems from the way we tend to view the worries and concerns of life. And I think that stems from man's own short-sightedness. And I think the problem is that we tend to see our problems, our predicaments, our concerns through a prescriptive lens. What do you mean? A prescription. You, oh, well, I'm going to give you this and you take it and it'll fix your problem. Uh, if only I had the money. Prescription. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be stressing so much. If only my health wasn't so poor, I could rest easy. Prescription. If only I had the perfect spouse who loved me exactly how I wanted, I could stop fearing that I'll never get married. Prescription. You see, there's nothing wrong with wanting these things. Can I tell you, church? There's nothing wrong with desiring these things in your life. But the true error is that we are trying to reach an intangible conclusion. Not having to worry. Not having to stress. Not having to feel fear, anxiety, concern. That's an intangible and we're trying to prescribe a tangible solution. Wealth, health, husband, wife, it doesn't matter. We're trying to prescribe a solution, a medicine to a spiritual problem. Have you ever considered that the stress that comes from maybe making more money is not worth the effort? It's not worth making more. You're just going to be more stressed. Have you ever found, uh, cons uh, pondered the fact that your physical health may just open you up to new kinds of worry? Have you thought that maybe that spouse you're praying for that would end up being your dream uh, woman or dream man just might end up being a nightmare? And you'll be praying, wishing you could get out of it two years from now. You see, none of these things can ever take the worry out of your life. The only thing that they'll ever do 
is change the venue through which you experience worry. You got money now. Now you have money problems. All right? You're healthier now. All right, now get to work. Oh, you got married. Great. I hope you enjoy marital problems. It never changes, it, it, or it never goes away. It just changes how you experience the concerns and worries and, 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 and issues of life. So if these things aren't the solutions to your sorrows, well, what is it? In order to find the solution, we need to redefine the problem. The problem is not an abundance of worry. You hear me? Let me say that again. Your problem is not an abundance of worry. Your problem is a lack of peace. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines peace as this. In a general sense, a state of quiet or tranquility, freedom from disturbance or agitation, applicable to society, to individuals, or to the temper of the mind. Remember that magic medicine I spoke to you about? If the whole world had access to this magic medicine, do you think they would take it? Some of you say, well, yeah, obviously. The problem is they do, and they haven't taken it. What if I told you that that medicine was available to you this whole time? You don't need to be rich to, to buy it. You don't need to be well-connected to get your hands on it. You don't need to be in a hospital to get it. You could be in a prison and have this medicine. Now, the Bible says here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You don't need money, you don't need medicine, you don't need marriage, you, don't, you only need the mediator. You don't need prosperity, you don't need pills, you don't need a partner, you need prayer. Now let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this message. Father God, I come to you humbly on my knees and I ask you in Jesus' holy name that you would anoint this message, Father, that you would bless the people here and, and, and please, Lord, open up their hearts to the preaching of the word of God. I pray that you can minister to their needs, to their desires and concerns and worries and issues of life. And Father, that at the end of this sermon, that after all is said and done, we could walk away having peace. Father, I pray peace for every individual in this room and for anyone watching, Lord, that may not be saved. I pray that you would impress it on their heart, Father, to find peace through your Son, Jesus Christ. Please bless this message in Jesus' holy name. I pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, the first point I'd like to bring to you is about this prayer. The title of this message, by the way, is Pursuing Peace Through Prayer. Pursuing peace through prayer. Now, the first point is perplexity preceding prayer. Perplexity preceding prayer. Have you ever been perplexed before? Have you ever just been miffed, wondered, concerned, just not sure of what's really going on? Concerned, in anxiety, stress, whatever you want to call it, we've all experienced perplexity before. I want to draw your attention to the first, uh, verse 6. The first two words, or verse, first four words, be careful for nothing. What is being careful? Well, it's being full of care. The problem many Christians face today is they just care too much. They care too much. Well, you, it's, not, it's not a sin to care about the right, the right things, right? Yeah, the problem is we care too much about the wrong thing. We, t we care too much about the concerns in our life and think that, well, if only I had this, this cure, my concerns would scram. You care too much. The Bible says to be careful for nothing. I want to show you three verses that talk about being too careful. First place I'd like to take you to, and keep your hands in Philippians, we'll be coming back. Keep your hands in Philippians, we'll be coming back. But the first place I want to take you to is Daniel chapter 3. We are too careful regarding popularity. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says here in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these are the three Hebrew children that were taken into captivity in Babylon, and they were put in front of the king, and they were commanded to worship and bow before Nebuchadnezzar's image. 
And they said, they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I don't know about you, I don't, I'd be quaking in my boots if I was commanded to bow, and otherwise I'd be killed. But here we see the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were bold. They were not careful to answer Nebuchadnezzar on this matter. They weren't afraid of what others may think of them. They weren't concerned about popularity. They weren't, uh, they weren't worried about what others might con- uh, conceive about their own spiritual walk. Did you see they didn't worship the golden image? You see, oftentimes the worries in our life are a result of placing too much stock in the wrong things. And we place too much stock in the idea of being accepted or being popular or being loved. Can I tell you something? If Jesus loves you, that's good enough. You don't need anyone else's love to make it through life. Because oftentimes you're not going to get it. The Hebrew children in the book of Daniel were bold and were willing to face the consequences of not bowing, of not wanting to be popular. Rather than caring about the public perception, they picked to preserve their purity and principles. The fear of being an outcast or labeled as being different will hinder your walk. The Bible says that the fear of man casteth a snare. Well, I don't fear anyone. That's why I'm in a Bible-believing church. You fear what other people in your church think of you. You fear what that pastor might think of you. You fear what that sister in Christ might think of you if, uh, if, if you didn't agree with them 100%. We have too much fear. Not me. Not me. Wait till you get tested. You have it. Didn't I just preach on pride last week? See, that's the common error in most Christians is that message is for, for them and not me. And you'll start to confess other people's sins and say, God, I really hope they get this message. I really hope. I, this is clearly directed at that brother over there. That message on pride, that was clearly directed at Brother David. All right? That message on vanity, oh, well, phew, Brother Jesse, that's all him. Yeah, you should maybe look in the mirror. You place too much stock in the wrong things. And notice how their faith was not in man. Their faith was in God. For verse 17 said, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of of thine hand, O king. See, the fear of being an outcast is going to keep you from having a clean spiritual walk with the Lord. The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are you placing your faith in Man over God? Are you placing your cares upon the cares of this world and not the cares of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, of course I'm placing them in God. Then how come you're so afraid? How come you're so worried? The next place I want to take you to that we're too careful in, and I've only found three places where the Bible talks about carefulness being a bad thing. Only three places. Now, I could be wrong. You might check my work after that. But I found three places where carefulness is not a good thing. The next place that we're too careful for is we're too careful regarding partnership. 1 Corinthians 7.25. 1 Corinthians 7.25. The Bible says here, now let me give you the context here. Now Apostle Paul is talking about marriage and he's verse 7 to 8, uh, verse 7 to 9. It says, For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to uh, marry than to burn. Now Apostle Paul is saying, listen, if you want to get married, get married. If you don't, don't. That's your decision. You can choose whichever you like. Now, verse 25, it says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. 
Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth, that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. Now let me pause here and just explain what he's saying. He's saying that there, some pe- you've got to have a balance when you're married. Some people are too married. Did you know that? Some people are just too married, and they can't get out of their wife's hair, or the the wife just can't get out of the husband's business, and they never separate. They never find time to be alone with God. But verse 31, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. You see, use what God has given you, but don't abuse it. Don't be too on one side over the other. Verse 32, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely and that... Uh, ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Apostle Paul is pretty much just saying, listen, I'm not trying to press you to do one or the other. Do whichever one makes you happy. Don't pressure someone into, into something they don't want to do. Don't be, too, don't be so careful. Don't be so, oh, will he or won't he? Or, oh, I just want to be with that person. Or, oh, I just want to marry this person. Uh, we take too much stock in the idea that that special person is going to be the answer to all our problems. Uh, we have a married man in here. Is marriage the end of all your problems? He's nodding his head in case his wife's watching. It's not. (laughs) It's not the end of your problems. Again, there's nothing wrong with desiring a wife. There's nothing wrong with desiring a husband. These are good things, and if you you obtain favor of the Lord if you get one. But it's not the prescription. It's not how you pursue peace. And if you're married, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the married life. Just Don't let the cares of this world affect the peace that you can have with God. See, you think that a happy wife means a happy life. No, all right? Your idea, your object is to please the Lord, not to please your partner. We're too careful in this matter. We we think that these problems are just begging a solution in the world. But your prizes... Your prized possessions, they can't provide peace. Why? For the richest man still fears becoming a pauper. Why? Because riches can't give you peace. The most powerful man still worries losing control because power can't provide peace. The The prettiest woman still has anxiety over one gray hair or one wrinkle. Beauty can't provide peace. The most popular girl in school still panics over one rumor. Popularity can't provide peace. The most, the most athletic boy still stresses over one injury. Athleticism can't provide peace. The happiest wife still wonders if it will be a happy marriage down the road. Marriage can't provide peace. The most successful husband is still nagged by a poor economy, worrying that he can't provide. Success can't provide peace. And the most loved child still is too scared to sleep in the dark. Love can't provide peace. We're too careful. We're too careful. We're seeking these things and hoping that they'll find peace. The next place I want to show you is in Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Can I tell you, church? We're too careful regarding our prosperity. We're too careful regarding our prosperity. Proverbs 17, verse 7 to 9. Proverbs, I'm sorry, did I say Proverbs? Jeremiah, Jeremiah. I'm on the P word. (laughs) Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 to 9. We're too careful regarding prosperity. It says here in Jeremiah 17, verse 7, 
Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whoso ho- whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. I just wanted to tell you those last two verses. We're too careful regarding that drought, and we're worried about the economy. We're worried about gas prices. We're worried about Russia, China. We're worried about Israel and Hamas. And we're so concerned over the things going on in the world that we've forgotten about the things going on up in heaven. Are you perplexed, Christian? It's, it's, a, it's not good to be so careful concerning what you're going to eat tomorrow or how you're going to provide. Listen, if you're serving God, do you think God's going to let you go hungry? Do you think God's going to let your children starve to death? Do you think God is going to keep you from finding shelter? Is that what you think of them? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, don't turn with me, but it says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the, is the evil thereof. You're so concerned over the things of this world God says, don't even worry about it. Forget about tomorrow. You're worried about making ends meet tomorrow? Just focus on today. God, I I just, I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford that. Don't worry about it. You're too careful. God, I just, I I don't want to be alone. Stop worrying about it. What what is worrying going to do for you? Is it going to make you happier? Why is it that we just love to cling to that? It's like wasted energy. If you can't do anything about it, then why worry about it? So we have the perplexities preceding prayer. Now let's talk about the prayer. There is a panorama perspective of prayer. Go back to Philippians 4. And I'm going to try and hurry. I don't want to rush. I don't want to keep you too long. But it says here, be careful for nothing, but in everything. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace uh, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. The Bible te- tells us, teaches us to pray over every concern. Well, I just don't think God wants to hear about that. No, He does. Understand that God desires to hear from you. Not just about the spiritual things in your life, like, oh, God, thank you for that church service that you blessed me with, and thank you, Lord, for that brother in Christ, and thank you, Lord, for... Did you know he wants to hear about the not-so-spiritual things, too? It's not a sin to... If it's not a sin to have, it's not a sin to pray for. If you feel that your family is growing apart and you just want to take your family out on a nice trip up to the mountains and spend time together with them, and enjoy enjoy life with them, and get closer to them, do you think that's a sin? Why don't you bring it to the Lord and say, God, I really want this so I can have that special time with my family, and I think it would glorify you. That carnal prayer, God's going to hear that in everything by prayer and supplication. Are there some unspiritual concerns in your life? Like, God, I'm just so worried. I'm worried about this foot pain I have right now, or I'm worried about um, that concern I have with that brother or sister in Christ, or I'm just so caught up in this. And again, you're just too careful. Take it to God. Stop worrying about it. You can't do anything about it. Why don't you give it to the person that can? Jesus Christ. Realize that just because you ask God something and think it's carnal, and think it's just, well, God, why would you ever let me have that? It's not something spiritual. How many of you have dads? Was that always the case with your dad? I mean, wasn't there a time where dad just wanted to 
bless you with a gift, a carnal gift? Like, son, here's a basketball hoop. Do you think God's any different? Do you think he, he only wants to please you in a spiritual... He, he wants to provide all your needs. If it's not a sin to have, why don't you pray for it? God, I, 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 just, pray for, um, I just pray for that job. I, I think it would really get me out of this case where I'm just so stressed out and I really think it'd be a better, uh, a better place for me. Will you give it to me? Hey, if it's not a sin, pray. Now, we're to pray over every concern, and we're to pray with exceeding contentment. You see, the secret ingredient in all of this through prayer is right there in verse 6. Everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. The secret ingredient is thankfulness. Just like any relationship, any relationship, whether it be business, whether it be uh, whether it be romance, whether it be family, whether it be friends, thanksgiving, th- giving thanks, being appreciative is the, is the key to making that thing run smoothly. It's the attitude of gratitude, and it's always needed. The idea is that when you ask God for something, you should already have something in mind to thank Him for. Before you go and ask God for something, is there something you can at least thank God, like, God, thank you for, uh, thank you for this church. Thank you for uh, my vehicle. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my uh, just spiritual walk. Thank you for anything. Do you, do you really think God wants to wait on someone hand and foot that just feels entitled? Like, you owe me this, God? Can't you see I'm hot stuff over here? Why don't, you, why don't you just do what I want, God? Is that the kind of attitude God is going to honor? There's nothing more off-putting than entitlement. When you do something nice for a person and they just start to expect it like, well, that's your job, right? Your job is to spoil me like royalty. Is that going to make you want to do that again? Gratitude must properly be expressed to the Lord. It's not the kind of gratitude that you show when someone just holds the door open for you at the supermarket. Oh, thanks. That gratitude is a meaningless kind of gratitude. It's just a, it's just a social norm. The gratitude God wants you to show Him is a deep-seated contentment and appreciation for His faithfulness in providing for you. And if you're too blind to see how God has been faithful to you, you need to get a reality check, all right? Because that's the reason why you don't have peace. Can you thank God for something today? Can you thank God for the things, the blessings in your life? Can you thank God for the problems? All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If you can thank God for all things, and all things give thanks, 1 Thessalonians, and all things work together for good, then even the bad things in your life are worth thanking Him for, aren't they? Can you think of some things right now that you're thankful for? Can you think of some blessings that you're thankful for? Can you think of some problems that you're thankful for? Understand that God is going to use those problems to help you to conform to Jesus' image. And if you're too blind to see that, well, you're going to only endure longer. Why not just learn the lesson now and and, and stop wasting years of your life not learning the same mistakes you've been making for years and years and years? You could save yourself so much trouble. You could get yourself so much more peace. So we're to pray in exceeding contentment, we're to, pr- we're to pray over every concern, and we're to pray with eager confidence. Know how it said there, let the request be na- made known unto God. We need to understand just who it is that we're asking. The Bible says in Hebrews, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace and mercy that we may obtain a throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you go into that throne room, you know who you're talking to? You're talking to the king of the universe. We're speaking to the God of all creation when we come to the Lord in prayer. 
I think one of the most astounding things is that the God of all creation has an active and vested interest in your day-to-day life. He cares about the little things in your life. Not just the, did you go to church today? Did you read your Bible? Did you pray? Did you tell someone about Jesus? Those are the basics. God doesn't just care about the basics. He doesn't just care about the big things. He cares about the little things. I mean, I'm sure you can remember one, maybe one day going home from school and hearing from your parent, hey, how was school? And they just wanted to hear about how your day went. It's not going to make their day any more exciting. It's not going to make their life any more enriched. It's just they love you. They want to hear from you. He's commanded and instructed us to pray to Him and make requests to Him regarding everything in our life. It's in His hands that we are commending these seemingly trivial, trite, unimportant affairs in our day-to-day lives. And I say all that to say this. If the God of this world, if the, or the, if the God of this universe can hold all the atoms in the universe together and to keep them from splitting apart, if the God of this universe can create the oceans and the stars and the sky and the earth and the, and the plants and the animals, if He can create you with the breath of God, shouldn't we have a little bit more confidence in His ability to answer our prayers? Shouldn't we at least be a little bit more confident that because God wants to hear our our day-to-day meaningless little requests, the stupid little ones, like, why would I even ask that of the king of the universe that's beneath him? No, it's not. He wants to know. He wants to answer them. And the problem is you think that he doesn't. You think it's not worth bringing up to him. Like, God, I, you know, I know it's stupid, but I really just want this one thing. And if it's in your will, can you please give that to me? What do you think he's going to say? Yeah, get out of here, kid. No, he's not like that. The closer you get to him, the more you start to know his, the way the Lord works. You start to get to understand him as a person because that's just what God is, a person. He's not some force up in a world that you can never know. He's not Allah, all right? He's a personal God you can know on a personal, intimate, deep level. And the relationship that you have with Him is different than the relationship I can have with Him. And no two relationships are the same. And that's what makes it such a special, endearing, intimate, familiar kind of relationship that you can have with the God that created every single atom in this universe. You need to learn to appreciate that and to take that into consideration. That if that God wants to hear your prayers and answer them, Let me put it like this. If the king of this country, America, if the king of this country wrote you personally and saying, listen, Hiram, I like you and I want to just go ahead and give you anything you want. If it's within my power, if it's not something that is sinful, if it's not something wrong, I want to go ahead and give it to you, just anything you want. How many of you would take the time to write them back? I'd give him a 40-page document on everything I want. But we never take him up on it. Thank you for this food, Lord. Lord, please help me as I go to work. Thank you, Father God. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for the offering. Is that it? Is that all you got? You think the God of the universe can't give you more? I'm not preaching prosperity gospel. I'm just telling you, you can have a more enriching, fulfilling prayer life if you take into consideration just what God is. Now we have the, we have the sorry, perplexity preceding prayer. We have a panor, panorama perspective of prayer. And finally, we have powerful peace through prayer. Verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We receive the promise of peace through prayer. It's not the fact that God answers your prayers that gives you peace. Answered prayers aren't your, aren't your source of peace and fulfilling and tranquility and quietness. This is the most important point of my message, so please listen. 
The peace that we so desperately want in our lives isn't given to us because God answered everything you wanted, the way you wanted, how you wanted, when you wanted. That's not when peace is given to you. Peace isn't derived from getting, what God, uh, getting from God what you asked from Him. Notice how the verse says here, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is a plain promise that if you pray to, Lord, pray to the Lord and give it all up to Him and just put it all at the altar and say, God, this is yours. I don't know what to do with it. I know you do. That's when the peace comes. When you place your trust like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when you put everything on the table, when you put all your chips down and laid it all before him on the altar and said, God, I just want to put this before you. This is my concern. This is my worry. I'm tired trying to fix things myself. I'm, trying to, trying to, I'm tired trying to pursue my own will. Lord, here's my problems. They're in your hands. And that's when the peace of God starts to come into your life and you start to submit and you start to, uh, you start to allow God to take control. Because again, if he's the one that's in charge, if he's the one you've given it to, you can trust him with it. You can trust him with your life. You can trust Him with your money. You can trust Him with your health. You can trust Him with your relationships. Have you brought it to the Lord in prayer? That peace, man, we receive that peace in passing. Don't worry about that. That was the Holy Spirit coming in. We receive that peace in passing. What do you mean? Read here again in verse 7. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding. This is a supernatural kind of peace. That peace is better than the kind that you get from popularity. For the Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That peace is better than the kind you get from partnership. For the Bible says, It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. And might I add, a contentious and angry man. That peace is better than any prosperity, for the Bible says, for riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. That peace is a supernatural peace that just defies all expectation. It's the kind of peace you can have in a prison cell. It's the kind of peace you can have in, the, in, in, in your 34 Hampton suite up there in New York. It's, it's the kind of peace that you can have wherever you go, in whatever circumstance, in whatever trial and tribulation that you're going through. God can give you that peace if you just pray to Him and lay it all at the altar. Now, my final point here, and we're done, I want to draw your attention to the most important part of this verse. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When we pray to the Lord... For peace, we receive peace through the pathway of peace. It's all thanks to Jesus Christ that we can have our hearts and minds set in Him and have perfect peace and tranquility in whatever occasion it calls for. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have peace. You need Jesus Christ to experience that peace which passeth all human worry, all fears, all uh, concerns, anxieties, and hang-ups. And if you do have Jesus Christ, but somehow lately you just feel like you haven't had peace, you haven't had that ease in your mind, that tranquility, well, there's an altar right here. And you can come and pray and put all your problems in the nail-pierced palms of the Prince of Peace. And if you put it in his hands, I promise you, you'll do a better job than you have. Altar calls now open. Go ahead. Altar calls open. Every head bowed, every eye shut. Altar calls open. If there's some things in your life that you just haven't had peace over, problems, predicaments, 
perplexities. Prayer is the answer. Prayer is how you get peace. You don't find it. You don't find it in a bank. You don't find it in a bridal shower. You don't find it in a hospital. You find it at the altar of prayer. You find it in the nail-pierced palms of Jesus Christ. When you've laid it all at the altar, the concerns that you just haven't been able to address, the things that you haven't been able to fix, and you allow Him and trust Him to provide for you and and to do everything in your stead. Take no thought for tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Don't be so careful. Stop worrying about what others think of you. Stop worrying about if you can make it till tomorrow. Stop worrying about your popularity or your, or your prized possessions. You don't need that to have peace. That's a tangible. The physical world is tangible. You can see it. But when you're trying to pursue an intangible item like peace, you can only find it in the intangible, the Spirit of God. I trust that as you pray, you give God everything, the little things, the big things, the things that you think are beneath the Lord. If it's really concerning you, God, God is the person to come to. And you will have perfect peace. Take your time. Don't be concerned if you want to spend some extra time with the Lord and just lift these prayers up to you. You might be thinking, well, God, this person just doesn't understand what I... God is the one that you're going to find peace and pleasure from. People won't please you. People won't give you peace. Prosperity won't give you peace. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. All right. We're going to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And if you're still praying, take your time. Father God, we ask you in Jesus' holy name that this message was a blessing to someone. I pray, Father, that as we have come to you before the altar of, of mercy, that we might obtain grace in time of need. Lord, even the little things, Lord, let us commend it into thine hands. Father, shall not the God of the world, shall not the judge do right? Lord, 